This is Google Maps. I use it every day to get directions from my home to anywhere I'm going. Seems pretty common, right? But how does it even work? Well, I was asked this question in an interview and this is a pretty complicated use case of a data structure called graph. Not this one, but this one. This might be the first time or the one millionth time that you're hearing about data structures. And you might be wondering what all of these words mean. So here are all the data structures that you need to know before you start interviewing for any company. Spoiler alert, it is really, really boring. But I think it is one of the most essential parts of software development. We'll go over why each one of them is important in their own way. When to use them, how to use them, how they are stored in the memory. I'll try to keep most of this language independent, but if it is not, it's probably C++. Also, it's okay if you feel overwhelmed with all of this. You aren't supposed to learn all of this in a 10, 15 minute YouTube video. It usually takes weeks, if not months of practice. Also, a lot of this will be really watered down simple definitions. If you want to know the proper definitions, you can check out some books that I'll link below. But before we start, let me tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Hostinger. If you want to host your projects, you should check out Hostinger. It's a web hosting platform that provides seamless management tools, website speed, and 24 by 7 customer support. You can read more about Hostinger on their website at hostinger.in slash above or click on the link in description. I've been personally using Hostinger for quite some time, around five years now to host my own website and some websites that I've built for other people. And I've been really impressed by their services. Shared hosting, VPS, WordPress, cloud hosting, you name it, they have it. Right now you can use this exclusive grab on coupon grab host to get extra benefits that is up to 75% off plus additional 10% discount on web hosting and extra months for free. Use the coupon grab host or check the first link down in the description below. But before we start with data structures, you need to know about data types. With every programming language, we need to store some data and every programming language gives us some basic data types that we can use to store that data. For example, in C++, we have int, char, boolean, float, and double. We can store these type of data and then perform calculations and operations over this data. Int is for integers like 1, 2, 3 and negative integers like minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. Char is for storing characters like ABC, PQR. Boolean is used to store true or false. Next up, float is used to store floating point numbers that is decimal numbers. That is 1.2, 3.5, 9.8, 7.6, 5, 4. Double is also used to store decimal point numbers. So you might be wondering why do we need float and double in the same language, right? Well, decimals are pretty weird. There are a few memes on JavaScript because of this. So double is like float but it is a lot more precise and it can store way larger values. But the drawback is that it is way slower than float. A lot of programming languages force you to mention a data type while making an integer. And these languages are known as strongly typed languages because you have to mention a type. Languages like C++ and Java are strongly typed. And some languages don't need you to define a type. These are known as loosely typed languages like JavaScript and Perl and PHP. All these data types have limits. That is the amount of data they can store. Like integer has a limit of two to the power 31 and computer can only store numbers. Numbers. So characters are stored as numbers and the table that is used to map from a character to a number is known as an ASCII table. Okay, if this is all the data that I can store in a computer, how am I supposed to take over the world with my new sentient AI? That's where data structures come in. Data structures are just ways to store data so that it is really efficient to store it and retrieve it and process it based on the type of program that you have. Efficiency is the key here. We really want our programs to be really, really efficient and we measure it in two ways. The amount of memory it uses and the amount of operation it has to perform. And we use the big O notation to write it. Cool, let's try to build some efficient programs. Let's say you need to define a variable. Pretty simple, right? Let's say I ask you to define 10 more variables. That will be a little tiring, but you'll be able to do that. What if I ask you to define a million variables? Yeah, that will make you pretty sad, right? So that's where arrays come in. Arrays are nothing but basically a list of variables. You mention the type of variable you need, write the name of the variable and how long of a list you want. So I can write an integer array of size 10 or I can write an integer array of size 1 million in one line. And you can use the square brackets to actually access or update the data in this array. It starts from zero and goes till n minus one. So let's say I have an array of size 10, it will go from zero to nine. That is zero based indexing. Don't ask why it works that way. It makes sense, trust me. So how are they stored in the memory? Well, it's pretty simple. The compiler actually reserves the number of places that you want in the memory in a sequence based on whatever length that you have defined and you can access it and then put data in it and then retrieve data from it. But what if the memory just after that is given to some other function or some other variable? That means we can't change the size of an array once it is defined. And that is problematic if you have to create a dynamic array that changes its size based on the number of elements it has. Well, C++ already has a dynamic array in its STL library called vector. And how it works is it starts with an array of size one. 
and as soon as it is filled, it doubles the size and copies all the contents to the new array, deletes the previous array and points the variable to the newer array. Then that fills up, it does the same. It creates another array, double the size, it copies all the data, it deletes the previous array and points the variable to the newer array. And we keep on doing this whenever we run out of space. That's pretty cool and it's not that difficult to implement. You should try to implement it on your own. So right now we can insert, update or retrieve data from anywhere in the array. What if I add a condition that we can only add at the back of the array and remove elements from the back of the array? Well, we call it a stack, like a stack of books. You add books on the top and you remove books from the top. And the other version of this is we add elements from one end and remove the elements from the other. So let's say we add it from the back and remove it from the front. This is called a queue, like a queue of people. People join in from the back and they leave from the front. Both of these are based on arrays or linked list that is coming next. And they are just a special version of this. The queue follows a FIFO order that is first in, first out. The stack, on the other hand, follows a leaf order. I'll let you figure that one out. Another cool thing is that we can create arrays of arrays. These are called multi-dimensional arrays or matrices or matrix. Let's say we have an array of length 5 and every element of that array is another array of length 5. That means we have 25 places and we can show it like a grid, like a chess grid. And C++ makes it really easy to initialize. You just have to write the data type, name of the array and two square brackets denoting the size. We can create 2D matrix, 3D matrix, that means three dimensions, or we can go to any number of dimensions, but it becomes very difficult to visualize. So what I do is I create an array of the first dimension and then I create another array within that of the second dimension. And I think that's it. I try to work with just 2D arrays, but it is a lot more easier to visualize. Cool, moving on, we have linked list that I just mentioned briefly. So linked list is a type of list. So how is it different from arrays then? Well, linked list follows a completely different approach. We create a node and whenever we need to add data to the list, we go to the last element, create another node and link the last node to the previous node. So we don't have to give it a length, it's dynamic. We can delete nodes, we can add nodes, we can update the size. Every node has two things. It has some data and a pointer to the next node. That is where the next node is present in the memory. And we keep the address of the first node as the head node. So initially we have nothing for the head node. Then we create a node, copy its address to the head. Then we create another node and link that node to the first node. And we keep on doing this for as many nodes as we want. But one caveat here is that we cannot randomly access any node. We don't have its memory location. We'll have to go to the first node, then go to the second node, then go to the third node, and then and we'll eventually reach the node that we actually want. This means that if we lose the pointer to the first node, essentially our entire linked list is lost in memory. Also, what if we connect the last node back to the first node? Cool, you've just made a circular linked list. And let's say for every node, we store the pointer to the previous node as well. For a current node, I can go to the right node or the left node. Cool, you have just made a doubly linked list. And you can mix both of them to create a doubly circular linked list. One really amazing question that I can remember for a doubly linked list is LRU cache. You should go ahead and source that if you are trying to really understand how to use a doubly linked list. That's a pretty cool question. Cool, let's move on to non-linear data structures, starting with tree. Not this tree, but this tree. So this is like opposite of a normal tree. We have the root node on the top, then we have a few level of nodes below it. So every node has a parent node and that is the child of the parent node. So you get it. And nodes that don't have any child nodes are known as leaf nodes. And that is pretty much the basic structure of a tree. Think of it as like a hierarchy, like a folder structure. So we have C, then we have users, and then we have desktop and document folder, or we can go to system folder, or we can go to the program files folder. So that makes a tree. Or think of it as like a startup hierarchy. We have the CEO and below him we have the CTO and CFO and a lot of other people and below them we have the managers and the engineers and everyone. So even a single node is a tree. It's the root node and the leaf node and then we can have subtrees as well that is just another tree below the root node. So in memory every node has a data and a list of its child nodes. That's pretty much it. So whenever we create a child node we add the address of the child node in the list of children for a particular parent node. So let's add some restriction here. So what if I only allow two child nodes, one left child and one right child. Congratulations, you have a binary tree. So that means the tree that we were currently talking about was an n array tree and the list of children will be updated to a left child and a right child in the node structure. And if you haven't solved a lot of lead code style questions, binary trees are a lot more important than n array trees. You'll usually be working with binary trees. Let's add another restriction. What if the left child node has to be smaller than the root node and the right child node has to be bigger than the root? 
congratulations you got yourself a binary search tree or bst for short a bst is really famous for keeping the data sorted so whenever we give it a new data it adds it to the tree and it will be really important moving forward for another data structure but uh, the problem it runs into is what if i only give you increasing numbers so it will create a node and then it will create a right child and a right and another right child so this creates an imbalance so we need to rebalance this tree to make it a lot more optimized so another data structure that looks a lot like a tree but isn't a tree is heap heap is a complete binary Tree. That means we can only add nodes from left to right and then move on to the next row. So we have to go from left to right and once a level is complete, we move to the child level. So there's one more restriction based on the type of heap that you create. There's two type of heaps, min heap and max heap. If you're creating a min heap, the parent node should always be smaller than the child nodes. And if you're creating a max heap, the parent node should always be bigger than the child nodes. That's it. So heap is really important in the heap sort algorithm and in general when we need to keep like k things sorted at once. Another data structure is a tree but with an i. So it is a tree but it is used for alphabet. So every node has spaces for 26 children from A to Z. So let's say we need to add A, B, C. So we create the first node and then we create another node and link it to A in the parent node. And then we create another node and link it to B in the parent node. And then we create another node and link it to C in the parent node. And we mark this node as an ending node. That means we have inserted A, B, C into the tree. Let's say we insert A, S, H and then we insert A, S, H, H, A, D. So what it does is that it uses the same prefix. So that saves a lot of memory and traversing it is really, really fast. So creating something like autocomplete or dictionary is really optimized in a tree and let's say we search for ashh it is present in the tree but the second h is not an ending node so that means ashh is effectively not present in the tree once i was asked to build autocomplete in an interview and i started with tree and the interviewer was really happy next up we have map so have you seen that in arrays we can go to any index and we can access the data, update the data and do whatever we want. So what if I don't have an index, but I want to do the same with a character. Like I give a character and I can go to some place where some data is stored. That is possible because characters are mapped to integers with ASCII. So you can create a 255 size array and use character as an index. But what if I want to do it with a string? So I need some way to map the string to an integer, like some sort of a function that takes a string and gives me an integer and creates unique integers for unique strings and gives me the same integer if I give it the same string. This function is already created and it's called a hash function. And this process is called hashing. Basically, you give it a string, it does its magic and it gives you a number. And hashing is a really interesting and detailed topic that we can pick up sometime later. So a map allows me to create mapping from A to B. A could be a lot of data types and B could be a lot of data types. So I can create a string to character, string to integer, integer to string, any sort of mapping. And it is mostly implemented using hashing. So I create a map, I give it a string usher. Internally, it hashes that string and gets an integer that is 9675 and it goes to the array searches for the 9675 index and stores whatever value i give it in that index so let's say i want to store 85000 that is the amount of subscribers that i have currently and if you haven't subscribed till now and if you're still watching go ahead and click on that subscribe button it really helps the channel and i really want to hit the 100k subscriber mark as soon as possible so go ahead and click on that subscribe button so whenever i pass ashad again it will go to that index and do whatever I ask it to do. Update the value or retrieve the value. So this is called the unordered map because it doesn't store data in order. That means we have an ordered map as well. And that uses RB trees, red black trees, which is just a variation of binary search tree and it self balances the tree. So that's how it keeps the data ordered. A set is pretty similar to a map. So it looks like an array, but every value in the set is unique. So a set can have any sort of value, integer, string, character, and all these values should be unique in a set. So it uses hashing to just make sure that this value hasn't been inserted before. Although it looks like an array, it is not implemented that way. We do have ordered set as well, which keeps the value unique and in a sorted manner, which is very useful in a lot of different cases. Lastly, we have the graph data structure. This one is pretty easy to visualize. We have a bunch of nodes and these nodes are connected to each other, similar to a tree, but we don't have the parent child concept here. The nodes next to a node are known as its adjacent nodes and the connection is known as an edge. The connection can have a weight, and then it is called a weighted graph or the connection can have a direction means a directed graph so basically going from a to b is possible but going from b to a is not and the direction can also have weights so that is a directed weighted graph that's like pretty common going from gurgaon to delhi in peak evening traffic it's really slow as compared to going from Delhi to Gurgaon during the same time. So there's two ways that we can store the data of like what node is next to another node. The first is called an adjacency list. It's basically a 2D matrix from all the nodes to all the nodes. So going from node A to B has some cost, 
we'll write it down. Going from A to A is not possible, so we'll mark it as X. Similarly, going from B to A has another cost. We'll write it down. Going from B to B doesn't make sense, so we'll mark it down as X. Another way is creating an adjacency list. In this, we create a list next to every node. To the node it can go to and the cost it takes. For A, we'll have one element B with the cost 5 and for B, we'll have one element A with the cost 5. This is called the adjacency list. These are two ways to actually store this data. So every node of the graph can contain the data and a list of all the adjacent nodes or we can create a global adjacency matrix. There's a lot to talk about in graphs but these were all the data structures that you need to know before you start interviewing anywhere. Because I have been asked almost all of these data structures, there's a lot more advanced data structures like segment tree and fenwick tree and a lot more. But these were all the ones that made up like 99% of the interviews that I've given. So these are really important. Also, if you want me to cover all the important algorithms like this one, tell me down in the comment section and drop a like on this video and I'll make it. Also, do check out Hostinger for all your web hosting needs, be it shared hosting, VPS, WordPress or cloud hosting. And use the first link in the description or the grab on coupon grab host to get extra benefits. That is up to 75% off plus additional 10% discount on web hosting and extra months for free. And if you're just getting started with solving lead code style questions, I solved over 950 of them and I learned a lot of different things on my way. So go ahead and check this video out so you don't make the same mistakes that I did. Bye bye.